Welcome, welcome to the Heads Together podcast. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Jill Mokes. Thank you for joining me again this week. I hope you have all been glued to the Shaman's Wife mini series. I've been taking a little bit of a break from recording solo episodes through the summer, and I'm so glad I did. Everyone has been so enjoying The Shaman's Wife. It's a fantastic miniseries. If you haven't caught up on it yet, do listen in. My guest, Alicia Rodriguez, sharing her story and brings lots of insights around her memoir published on the 10th of September available to pre-order now if we are still before that date. So do take a look at that. So yes, I've been taking a little short break. Hope you don't mind. I hope you haven't missed me too much in terms of podcast recording. I've also been really enjoying getting into my Substack. Yeah, everyone's laughing. I know because it doesn't take long before I'm talking about it again, but I just love that platform so much. And today I have come back to recording for a really special reason. And that is because I met Christine Sheehy, my guest for today on Substack. This is why I'm telling everyone what a lovely platform it is. You meet such amazing people. And as soon as I met Christine, I knew that I wanted to have her as my guest on the podcast. Christine is based in New Zealand. She lives in in New Zealand with her family. And she is a non-fiction book coach, and she helps coaches and experts become thought leaders. How freaking awesome is that? As soon as I got to grips with what Christine does, I was like, oh my God, she's the missing piece from my life. How long have I been talking to you wonderful people about writing my book? And yet I've been dancing around it and leaving it and putting it down and coming back to it and then ripping it up and starting again. And just, oh my goodness, something has been missing for me in the process. And Christine is someone who has this incredible framework for helping you find your core message and shape your ideas into a really compelling concept for your book. So This is how she works with her clients. She also helps people kind of shape their signature talks. She supports you and holds you accountable as you write your book or your book proposal if you're going to go down a traditional publishing route. But you can see how I was like, oh, yes, please, this is what I need. And we had a brilliant call together just, you know, off the back of meeting and chatting on Substack and just saying, hey, let's have a chat. We had such a good conversation together. And she's already given me so much insight into where I want my book to go and even what my book is. So I shall be very grateful to her for that. And I know that I'm going to be working with her moving forward. So I'm very excited for this interview because, like I say, I know that this is an ambition that lots of us share and becoming a published author. So this is going to be a great episode. So like I say, Christine lives in Matakana in New Zealand. I hope I said that right. Um, She lives with her husband and three school-aged children. And she has already written two nonfiction books and has contributed to several more. And she's actually certified in coaching nonfiction and memoir by the Author Accelerator. So Christine knows her stuff. I'm going to pop links in the show notes to all of the ways that you can reach out to Christine after the conversation. I'll also put in links to her work because I know you are going to get so much from this that you may well want to reach out to her after this. Okay, let's dive into the episode. Welcome, welcome to the Heads Together podcast. I'm Jill Mokes and I am obsessed with cutting through the noise when it comes to growing your business. Each week via intimate coaching conversations and inspirational stories, I share what it really takes to get the results you want in a way that feels right to you. I am all about attracting higher ticket opportunities 
building authentic relationships and creating the abundant, full-fat version of your dream business. I mean, how many of us have beavered away creating a light version of what we really want? The thing is, I honestly believe when you're outstanding at what you do, there is no limit to what you can achieve. So, are you ready to put our heads together and make it happen? Let's go. Hey, Christine, welcome to Heads Together. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jill. It's lovely to be here. This is very exciting because you're my first person, real life person that I've met from sub my new Substack journey. So this is really awesome. And you were my very first unknown Substack subscriber. So that's very exciting for me as well. I was just tentatively <laughs> dipping my toes in and lovely Jill was there to greet me, which was so nice. So thank you for that. Aww, you're so welcome. I really love it as a platform. I really do enjoy being on there. It's not like the other social media platforms. Also, my clients who are at the moment laughing as they listen to this because they all take bets at the moment as to how long I'm going to go in a session or in we we have a mastermind group as well where we meet all together so all my private clients meet together on a Monday and they now laugh and take bets at how long before I mention Substack just because I am slightly <laughs> obsessed with it at the moment so right now they're probably laughing at this episode like she had to go straight in there with the Substack straight in please to entertain everybody and I love it too it feels like a lovely thoughtful place to be at the moment so it really does. I'm just selfishly and unselfishly very happy to have you with me today because unselfishly, I just enjoyed our conversation so much that we had. And I think the work you do with women who are bringing their books to the world, their nonfiction books, which is your area of expertise. I think that work is so important. And what was interesting for me, and this is now the slightly selfishly part, was that when we were talking, I suddenly got really clear on why my book is not in the world yet. And it's because I don't have the support that I need yet. <laughs> and it's as simple as that. Really, just having that conversation with you and you were kind of so interested in the topic and and talking about it, it really reignited something in me and made me realize, you know what, I've just been dabbling around with the book. You know, I've dipped in, I've dipped out, I've dipped in, I've dipped out, but I've never really grabbed it by the horns and said, right, I'm going to make this happen until I started talking to you. <laughs> oh, well, that is lovely to hear. You know, I think you're not alone in that. And I often say that I think there's a lot of mythology around writing a book. It's a sort of, I don't know, this revered goal that a lot of us harbor, but it feels big. It feels daunting. There's a little bit of who am I that goes along with it. And so it's really easy for those little fragile writers' dreams to get squashed or for us to get too busy or there's other priorities and we put it aside. So I do believe it's one of those things, like really many of the arts, where support is really an incredible help to just actually pushing through and making that dream happen. Yeah, that's a really good point as well, is that it feels really fragile. Also, it feels so important. It's like it has to be the book. Mm. And I don't know if any, any listeners can relate to this. I think... It's almost like I obsess over getting it right, picking the r exact right topic, the exact right title, the exact right tagline, subtitle, the exact right format and chapters and, and everything becomes so important that it paralyzes me, I think. And so I've just kept playing with it around the edges, I guess. It's almost like we're treating it like a magnum opus, like it's got to be the book that Jill will write rather than w tackling one part of the journey that you're on because it is a journey. What you write now will be different from what you might have written five years ago or maybe in five years time because you're learning so and evolving and your work is evolving. So I think if we can break it down to something much smaller, much more focused that helps to make it you know, a bit more doable. But also I often advise clients to think of it 
like an invitation to explore a topic with you. So you're not positioning yourself as the guru or the expert in a particular area. It's like, this is something I'm really interested in. This is something I know about. This is something I share with my clients and I want to explore. So join me in that journey and share those stories, share that learning as you go, rather than feeling like you've got to know it all or get it right as such, because there is no right. Your work will evolve. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So when you work with clients, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you work with clients and the kind of work you do just as a precursor? Because I know that you've really kindly said that in this episode, we can actually go into a bit of the specifics around the book that I want to write and just talk about that a little bit more, which, and just to your point just now, I love to invite the listeners in to this journey. I'm really happy for everyone to be along for the ride with writing the book, you know, and I've been talking about it for so long now. So people listening are probably thinking, what you mean? You haven't actually written it yet. What the hell have you been <laughs> doing, woman? You've been talking about it for at least two years. <laughs> but I don't think that's unusual. No, it's not unusual. It's not unusual. And there's a lot of factors that play into that. But maybe if I start by just explaining how I came to this work and then the way that it, it has evolved over time. So um, I was doing copywriting, brand stories, brand messaging, and I had written a couple of books of my own. And clients kept asking me, oh, help me. I want to write a book. I want to write a book. And I kept thinking, oh, no. I couldn't think of a way to actually help them do it that would work as a coach partnership type setup. And it always seemed like a too big a task, I guess. And finally, in the lockdown years, a couple of clients really pushed, okay, I need help. This is the time I'm going to write the book. So we did it together. And it was an amazing journey. And I learned so much from helping them do that. But then I thought there's got to be a better way. We've got to be able to break this down because they were coming to me with lots of work that they'd done, thousands and thousands of words, and we were having to pull it all apart and go back and put the book together again. Mm. So I then trained with a company called Author Accelerator in the United States. And the part of the process that I found that I loved is actually to start well before the work is planned in the beginning so that we get the concept right, we get the framework for the book right, we understand the reader's journey from the beginning and we plan out what you're going to write so that you're not sort of writing a few pages and they're on one topic and you go down a rabbit hole and you lose your focus and then you get to the end and think, what is this? Which is what can happen if we just pants it, as they say, so sit down and fly by the seat of your pants. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can totally relate to that. As many people can. And I honestly think, again, that's part of that mythology of writing that, you know, we'll sit down and the muse will strike and the words will just flow and we'll know what to say. And actually, we can end up going way off track. And then you start to lose a bit of focus and, and faith in your idea, I think. And having that faith, that understanding of what this book is, who it's for from the get-go is really helpful to keep you on track, to make sure the reader delivers on its promise to the reader so that they get what they think they're going to get when they pick it up and so that you have something that you know actually delivers a result for them as well. So, yeah. So what I discovered was I love that beginning part. I just had to say that just you saying that part, it made me feel calmer already. I don't know how to explain it. It's like just having someone to help make sense of the concept because I think my overthinking happens when I feel like I'm alone with this idea and I don't even know if it makes sense. So therefore I second guess everything that I want to put into the book. And then I will quite often, as I have done over the last two years, rip everything up and start again. <laughs> And it's just so frustrating. But that thought of being calm and, okay, let's make sure the book delivers on its promise. So just that, for example, of beginning, with, you know, from there and working back, and it all makes me feel calm and, and it makes it feel more doable. So I just had to say that you have a, a really good way of making it feel doable. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> and that's really what it's about is, if, you know, if someone's going to spend time and money, but most importantly, time reading your book, reading your words, reading your ideas, then you've got to think about why they should invest their time in it, right? It's Sometimes people will say, I'll say, why do you want to write a book? Oh, because it's always been my dream. And that's wonderful. And it's not enough. It's not enough for the reader. You've got to think about why should they invest their time in reading this book? And so that comes down to what's that promise? 
What is it that you're going to deliver for them in this book? What is the the argument you're making or the thing you're going to teach them so that they close the book and go away, it's changed, transformed somehow? And you can think about it from, I imagine that a lot of your clients and listeners are already working in a space where they're creating programs or they're creating a product for their own clients. And it's very similar. This is, in a sense, a product. So what is it that, what's the need it's going to fulfill and how is it going to deliver on that? Mm, And that will definitely land. I think a lot of my clients absolutely are creating offers and and programs and You know, a lot of my listeners and clients are coaches and consultants of some kind working with their expertise. And so I think I'd go as far as say most of my clients have an ambition to write a book. A few of my clients have already published books and, but I would say most of them have that as an ambition. So I think this is going to really resonate with a lot of my listeners as something that always seems to be in the future. I would love to bucket. And what I think you do with people is bring it into the, no, it's doable now. It's doable now. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that can come back to feeling like it's got to encapsulate your whole body of work, but actually it it doesn't. It doesn't have to be your whole body of work because we see that authors and coaches will write a book and they will teach their particular philosophy or their topic now. And then two years later, they've moved on to another variation or another version of their expertise and they're sharing that idea. And so it doesn't have to be everything you've learned. In fact, that would in most cases be overwhelming. But if you have a particular take, a particular angle, something that can really drive you crazy about uh, your field, that you want to share a different perspective, you really want to open people's eyes to this way of looking at it, that's enough. It doesn't have to be everything. Yeah. And that's a relief. First of all, that is a relief because I think that's been the problem for me is like trying to pack in everything into, but almost like because I'm a business coach, I almost felt like my book had to be, you know, how to launch, grow, scale the ultimate business, you know, and that's a huge topic that would be. And that's just so overwhelming. And however I was breaking it down, I wasn't quite getting there in terms of getting to what my philosophy is around it. And then obviously, I think when you and I were talking and I was saying, oh, you know, and I I have this offer that I'm just finishing off at the moment, which is Rewild Your Business. It's a virtual retreat. And you said, well, isn't that the book? (laughs) And that was like, huh. (laughs) Hmm, Talk about hiding in plain sight, because that is my philosophy for business. Like, what the hell? How have I missed that? (laughs) Because it's hiding in plain sight. Again, very common. Uh, And we also spoke about how, to my mind, that is a very current topic in that I'm hearing everywhere people are frustrated with social media. They don't necessarily want to do all the things, all the strategies that the experts might say that you should do. They want to find a way to build a business that feels aligned, that feels comfortable, that feels sustainable in the sense that they can continue to do it and be consistent about it. And so this idea of actually peeling back the layers, stripping away the things that you don't need that aren't really either aligned with the way you want to do it or actually even generating the results. Sometimes we're showing up on a social media platform and it's really doing nothing for us, but we're still showing up there and putting our time and energy into that, plugging away without really questioning it. So it seems to me that that topic is very hot right now that people want a different approach and you've got the sitting right there Jill so how about we write the book (laughs) oh I mean god it is funny though because as soon as we started talking about that when we were chatting together and what came clear to me was that that doesn't feel overwhelming that book doesn't feel overwhelming the topic doesn't feel too big you know, I'm beginning to see what the flow of the book would be. And it just feels so much, like I say, so much more doable. So I'm I'm very grateful for that initial chat we had that brought me so much clarity. I know you specialize in nonfiction. Yeah. And that's your thing. What kind of clients do you work with the most? 
So a lot of my clients are coaches of some description, and that runs from life coaches. I've had fitness coaches, business coaches. The fascinating thing I found about that is because obviously when I'm working with people intensely on their books, I'm very mindful of confidentiality and not crossover and ideas and things like that. There's never been crossover and ideas. Despite working with a lot of coaches, everyone has their own take on it. It's fascinating and really exciting. So a lot of coaches and then subject matter experts. So I've worked with psychologists. I've worked with communications professionals, some people in design. Um, So all kinds of things, really, which is fascinating because it means I get to learn a lot of different things, which is one of my, I I want to say love languages. It's certainly one of the things I enjoy is to learn and be exposed to other people's ideas and get excited about other people's ideas. It really is I often describe it as a thought partnership because we are holding their ideas up to the light, testing them, seeing what what piece fits in what order, does that make sense, what's missing here. And you often can't see that yourself because you're so far in it. So it's not uncommon for the work we do around the book to unlock aha moments elsewhere in their business and they might go and reshuffle a program or come up with a new offer because just having someone to sit with your ideas and give you some feedback and test it can be so valuable in many ways. Absolutely. And with the process, I suppose, I'm interested in your process for supporting people to write their book because it, for you it, it's very much about getting the book written isn't it rather than the publishing side of things which is something completely separate I know can you kind of outline a little bit around what that process is or what that engagement looks like when you work with a client yeah sure very good question so the beginning part is what I call the roadmap for the book and that is the planning part and I do a lot of journaling work with my clients, so a lot of reflective questions. They will get little um, prompts they have to go away and write to to see what emerges because I do think that we know deep down what we want to say, but we haven't actually been able to articulate that. So there's a lot in the beginning stages of really digging deep into what this idea is and trying to just be able to encapsulate it neatly so that you can talk about it confidently, so that you know what it is, who it's for, and what your argument or point is, and what the promise is to the reader. So that's there's a lot of work where we seem to be kind of going around those questions in different ways, but the idea is to get to the themes, get to that clarity of idea, and feel that excitement of, yes, this is doable, and this is what I have to say. So that's the initial part. Then we will plan the book chapter by chapter. We'll look at what goes into a chapter so that they have a really structured process to follow. Some clients will deviate from that as they write and free flow, and that's fine. Others will need that real structure to be able to work, work to a framework as such. Actually, that's another word that's an important word. Often my clients have developed a way of working, something that they're teaching or a way of coaching over many years, but it may not be articulated as a framework as such or a learning framework. They haven't quite pulled all the pieces out or figured out how it slots together. It's just something that they do. Uh, And often they might feel like it's quite intuitive and tailored to each client, but we will often do some work around figuring out what that framework looks like because that can be really useful for the structure of the book. What comes first? What comes next? What comes so on? Finding those repeat processes and themes is a really important part of the work. So we do all that. Then it's about getting your writing. So usually there's a few chapters that we work on together which is usually rough and ready and about you finding your way into the voice of the book. So we're not focusing on perfection. We're focusing on words on the page, trying out different ways, different ways of telling a story, different ways of getting into the book itself and just finding a way that you feel comfortable and this is the voice that I want to write in, my natural way of writing this book. So that's the beginning block. And then after that, you have a pretty good plan of what you're going to do. As I say, it may You may adjust it, that's fine. It can be dynamic and flexible, but it's got the book in a nutshell. At that point, you would decide what your publishing journey is likely to be. So if you are wanting to pitch to an agent and a publisher, at that point you would look to develop a book proposal because for nonfiction that is not a memoir, so nonfiction that's a teaching book or a philosophy or self-help book, that kind of a thing, 
you can pitch based on the idea and a comprehensive proposal and some sample chapters. So you might decide that that's what you want to do. That's a big piece of work in itself. So I can guide you through that process. Or you might decide, actually, I want to write the book first, or I know that I want to self-publish, or I know that I want to go with a hybrid publisher, so where you you and the publisher both chip into the costs. Mm. Then in that case, you would go down the process of writing the manuscript. So we have a little sort of pick a path at that point. Yeah. And then it's up to you how much support you want during the writing. Some clients want me to read their chapters every fortnight and keep them on task and get it done by a certain date. Other clients will say, I'm really happy just to work on this now and I'll come back when I need extra support. I run community writing sessions on Zoom. So we just get together and have a little catch up and then we work on our projects in silence, which is amazing. It is because I do the same with Write Club. It's just, it's so good, isn't it? People get so much done. It's crazy. It is crazy. It's the silliest little simple thing, but blocking that time in your calendar, having other people in the Zoom room with you just keeps you actually dedicating that time to it. And if you're busy, you're running business, you know, you can have all the best intentions. I'll write so many times a week or I'll write every day this many words, but actually having a block of time that is non-negotiable really just means that you are moving forward. You do keep touching the work regularly. So you keep that energy and that aliveness in the work. You keep your connection to the work. It's a really powerful thing. So I love that. That's my Friday mornings. Yeah. So that's the process. Just that beginning part that you were talking about, that's what's been missing for me, for sure, is that I don't think I made firm enough decisions around the book of what the book was in the concept phase. And so then I would just have this kind of vague cloud representing the idea for the book. And then I would just go away and write. I would write. I have so much already written, but none of it feels cohesive and nothing feels like it's coming together in the form of a book. It just feels very disjointed. Probably lots of things that would be great for Substack, actually. So I could probably still use a lot of what I've already written. But I'm the sort of person where I work so much better if I have a proper plan in place. I just don't think I'm one of those people that can go off and completely write intuitively without a plan. Not if I want an actual book at the end of it that delivers on its promise to the reader, like you said. So I think that's what's really interesting for me is that I can see from what you said that that's what's been missing for me is to have the concept and a decision made on it. That accountability of someone else saying, okay, are we happy? Is that the decision? Yes, that's the decision. Okay, let's move on to the next part. That's what's been missing. So I've just been tumbling around with the same ideas kind of and then ripping them up and starting again and not actually moving forward with anything. And unless you have that clear point of view, say you are, as you mentioned before, writing a business book about how to launch, grow, and scale your business. First of all, that's three very different parts of the journey. So the person launching the business is not ready to scale. So there's a very different reader for those books and much to say on each of those topics, a book in themselves potentially. But without that clip on of view, you don't know what to keep in and out. Mm. And any time that you see another book that's about launch, growing and scaling a business, you'll think, oh, it's already done that. Oh, that's Marie Folio. She's already done that. She's got 50 million followers or or whatever. And, and you start to discount your own ideas. And it's because you didn't have that clear perspective on what your book offers to the conversation. So what do you bring to this conversation about launching, growing and scaling a business that someone else is not bringing or that isn't being said? What isn't being said is a great question to journal on. What isn't being said? Yeah, what isn't being said is absolutely genius journal prompt. Is that something that you come up against a lot with clients, this comparisonitis or this fear that everything's already been said? So what can I add? Yes, almost everybody comes up with that one at some point. What's the point? Someone else has already done it. And that's one reason I mentioned keeping on touching the work regularly because those fears can come up in the middle of a project as well, if you get a lull, if you've been away and then you got busy and then something happened with your dog or your child or your neighbor and you didn't get back to the book for a while and then you open it up and you think, 
oh, it's rubbish and this book's already come out and I'm too late. Yeah. That's not necessarily going to happen to everybody, but something of that variety can come up when you're not making forward progress with the book. So committing to your topic, keeping on moving even just a little bit each week, each day if you can, but each week is fine as well, you know, and then not setting a time period beyond which you won't go more than, say, 10 days without writing at least a couple of hundred words. And that just those sorts of boundaries can just help you keep that faith and not let those very common, almost cliche fears stop you from writing your book. But very real, very real, because they do come up. And they come up for published authors as well. They come up from very famous authors. They worry about a second album syndrome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, we've all heard of that, that you've already been success. How can you do it again? You know, you, it's very common. And it's part of the creative act. And so just accepting that. Letting them go, keep on touching the work. Even if it's rubbish today, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow you might have an amazing writing day. That phrase, keep touching the work, I feel like that is a really important one. I think that will stick in my head. Keep touching the work because I've experienced what you just said where you leave it for a while and when you come back, like when you started working on it, you're full of passion for it and loved everything that you were putting down on the page. And then you come back and it's like, oh, I don't feel the same about it now. And or this doesn't seem as good. And then instead of just thinking, okay, but it's okay for now because I'm not in an editing phase, I'm in a writing phase and it's okay to keep going with it. But instead it's like, no, it's no good. It's no good. I have to start again. Oh, and that's so frustrating. Yeah, and that can be really paralyzing. And we can get into the situation where we're rewriting chapter one over and over and over again, and we're not actually moving forward at all. So, you know, near enough is good enough. Move on, get the words on the page. Know that the first draft isn't going to be perfect. It never is. Mm -hmm. So just move forward, and then you can come back and you'll refine it again. It's all fine. My writing mentor, I guess, is Beth Kempton, who I just adore, love her. But she's always taught around this spilling all of your ideas. So kind of get all of the ideas out. Don't think about shaping it. That comes next. So spilling and then shaping and then sharing. And it's a really lovely way of thinking about it because it lets you let go of needing to kind of self-edit as you begin. It's just spill it all out. I guess it's like a bit like the artist way, Julia Cameron's artist way, where it's about morning pages are just about filling these pages with words. I think there's something, definitely something to be said by that. And that's something I really struggled with in the beginning. I think I'm getting a bit better at that now. But in the beginning, it was like every word that hit the page had to be really considered. And is this the correct word for this sentence? (laughs) Yeah. And and that's a very slow way, slow way to write a book. Very slow. One technique I love, which I've only recently learned, but is working for me at the moment, is James Scott Bell, I believe, is the originator of this technique. And it's been dubbed, perhaps not by him, the Nifty 350, which is write 350 words. And I believe the original technique, but apologies to James if I get this wrong, but is to just first thing in the morning, straight out of bed, 350 words. Just write it. And it's a really doable number. It is, yeah. It doesn't take you that long if you're fired up on your topic. I think I've done it in 12 minutes was when I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm writing today, you know, and it's it's done. If you pick a number like that and it's manageable if you don't have a lot of time and you make sure that so many times a week or have whatever works, you do at least 350 words, you will make progress towards your book. And it's 350 words forward. You're not editing the last ones. You just keep going. It can help to write the write the first sentence of the next bit or just start the paragraph or drop the idea for what comes next. So that when you come back, oh, yep, I'm writing about that walk on the beach. Great, 350 words. And there's a novelist in Australia, Sally Hepworth, and she used that. And it may be through her that I found that technique. In fact, she writes full-time as a novelist, but she does it in 350-word blocks. So she'll do the first one in the morning, get the kids off to school, do another 350 words go walk the dog, you know, another 350 words. And in those little chunks, at the end of the day, she's done quite a lot of work, but she's not sort of slogging at her desk for hours on end. Yeah, because however much you enjoy writing or even the process, I think it's quite overwhelming to think of just having to sit morning till night writing. It just, it's never going to work like that. You have to break it down somehow. I love the idea of Nifty 350. (laughs) 
That's really clever. Yeah. That's really good. And you know what? It's a really nice number because I know from writing like 500 word blog posts that those aren't that hard. I can turn out a 500 word blog post pretty easily. So a 350 commitment, that feels like very doable. Yeah. You've done a thousand words in a week if you do it three times a week and then, you know. So that's a 30,000 word book written in a month if you did it every day. If you did it every day, is that right? <laughs> I can't no, quite do the math. That's absolutely my... not right. Three... No, hang on. No. I don't know. It's a thousand words a week. Yeah. So if you did it every day, you'd write a thousand words in three days. So it's 10,000 words in a month. So three right? months, you could write a 30,000 yeah. word book. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's actually genius. That's how my brain works, is that I like breaking things down like that to be able to see that I'm making the progress. And again, that's what's been missing. I haven't been doing that. And sometimes you'll be on a roll and you'll just keep going and write lots more. But other times, if you've just done that 350 words and you know you've touched the work, you've made a little bit of progress. Touching the work. I love that. How important is it, Christine, that we understand what we want the book to do for us? So I guess as, as a coach... This is a question that I've pondered before. I know why I want to write a book. I love the process of writing. Do you know what? This is the honest answer. I love the idea of being a published author. I want to be able to say to people, I'm a published author. Right? I can't lie. That's a massive part of why I want to write the book. I do also think that I expect my book to do things for me too. Mm -hmm. in terms of credibility and in terms of door opening and that kind of thing. I know I didn't give you time to answer that question, but I guess the real question is, do you see or come across a big variety of reasons behind experts writing books? Do I see a big variety? There are definitely some common reasons right, to why people want to write books, and wanting to be an author is usually one of them. Not enough, as I say, but it is one of the things that's okay to go, actually, I want some recognition. I want to hold my work in my hands because I've done all this work. I've come up with this program or this philosophy, and it's sort of here. It's this amorphous thing, and I'm doing this great work with my clients, but I want it down on paper so it's something I can hold, can show my mum. That's it. I think there is that, isn't there? Yeah. There is that, but it's often about making an impact as well, Mm. and that is where, like you say, the book can open doors. You can send it to people when you're wanting to be on the podcast or you're wanting to speak at an event. You can sell it at an event. If you're doing a lot of speaking, it can be a wonderful add-on because people often, you know, they'll leave your talk fired up and want to know more. And then sometimes it's actually that there are people that can't afford to work with them, but they want to be able to help them. So if they have a book, it's a low cost product that they can sell. And they're like, look, you know, my package is at this, but this will get you started. And when you're ready, come back and work with me if you want to. But this, you'll get a result from this if you read my book. So that can be a really nice add on as well. That feels important. It's a really nice. I sometimes think that. I sometimes think, well, I know that I'm not the cheapest coach out there. And I'm absolutely unapologetic about that. I'm I'm good with that. And I know that I deliver value to my clients. So I'm absolutely fine with that. But there is sometimes a part of me that is like, I have so many things that I would love to be able to teach that are really quick wins as well. These are really things that are going to change the way you feel about your business. And I think the book, it, it fills that space for me too, being able to teach more to more people, Mm. regardless of whether they can work with me privately or not. It's another way. I think about the legacy as well when you've written a book. Yes. Of kind of after you've gone and having your words read by future generations, I think that feels amazing, particularly if you've got something important to say that you want to live on after you have passed. You know, like that feels really important to be able to capture your thoughts like that. Yeah. And I have had that from some clients where they've been working on a story that they want to tell. I do, I am certified to coach memoir and I occasionally do memoir. Mostly my clients are combining some kind of philosophy or teaching and story together. So that's where the memoir element comes in. But sometimes there's something that they've been through that's so transformative that they really want to record that for future generations, which is pretty special. 
but yeah, you're right. It's a wonderful window into what you were thinking, what you were doing, how you're, because my kids wouldn't know a lot about my work, but if it's in a book, they then get to understand what mum was doing there <laughs> all those years. So yeah, that is special. And there's just something about being able to hold your work in your hands. You know, here it is. This is my offering. It's an offering to your readers. It's an offering. And I think now that I've finally decided on what the book is, it feels like it's the obvious offering for me to put out there. Rewilding your business is a concept that I believe in so wholeheartedly. It's something that I do on an ongoing basis with my own business. For me, it's a bit, it's a connected a little bit with like decluttering. You know how decluttering your house can bring so much calmness to your mind and, you know, it's amazing. I think it's the same when it comes to rewilding your business. It's like, goodness, when you cut away a lot of the noise and, and stuff that you're doing and actually decide what to really focus on, it's absolutely transformational. The amount of time you claw back, the amount of focus you then have is bloody amazing. And I believe in that so much. Whereas I think for a while, I was trying to come up with a book topic that would sell. Mm. And I think this is something that I'm realizing now. And I don't really like admitting that, if I'm honest. But I do think there was a bit of an element of, I'd come up with an idea and dismiss it if I thought it wouldn't be commercially viable. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense, right. It does make yeah. sense. But I suppose I don't like that necessarily about myself. I would much rather be able to see, no, I'm, I felt called to write this incredible thing because it's my life's work, you know, but I don't think I did feel like that. I wanted to be a published author. And I wanted to hold my own book in my own hands, but I also wanted it to be like a amazing success. Mm. What does that mean? Yeah. So what does that mean? Oh, so I think the success of the book would be based on how it was received. Right. So the success wouldn't have been so much about the joy of completing the book and loving the work that I'd created, the offering, as you said. I think for me, success, as I was thinking about it then, would have been about the external validation of people telling me how good it was and buying it. And I think, yes, I would still love those things, but I can now see that those aren't the reason that I'm going to write the book. Those will be a very lovely side effect if that happens. It's much more now about, no, this is my very own philosophy, my very own I'm not saying it's unique to the point that no one else has considered this before about simplifying your business. I'm pretty damn sure they have. But I feel really compelled to get this out there. And I just don't know if I was coming at it from that angle before. That is fascinating, isn't it? Mm. And that's a lot of the stuff I think that we have around a book and what makes a book a success. And, you know, we're schooled from early on to think that if we get a publishing deal, if it makes a bestseller list, if it sells this many copies, you know, and there's so much of that is just outside your control. You can't know what's going to happen with any of that. You can only do your best. And I think that does put a lot of constraints on you when you're trying to meet those parameters and, and try and you know pick what's going to be the, the hot thing. I think I like to be quite realistic with clients at the beginning. I feel it's really important to talk about how difficult publishing is as a game in terms of pitching your book and getting a book deal. And I think it's really important to have that commercial lens on it, actually, and to understand that when a publisher invests in your book, if they buy your book and want to publish your book, they're essentially investing in a product that they need to be able to sell. So they are looking at it commercially, like how, what's the audience, how many copies can we move, and so on. And so that means there's only a really small number of books that will fit that criteria that they will want to invest in. But the really neat thing now is that there are other options open to us. A lot of entrepreneurs have a big audience already, a big following, or enough of a following to publish their books directly, to have more control of the process, to still create 
a really professional quality product and I think that's the key you know we used to talk about self-publishing as vanity publishing and all that that's moot now I think you know if you do it well and you get support you can produce a great book and get it out to an audience and have a lot of control over the process and it can fill needs in your business or in your personal work that doesn't require going down the conventional publishing route if that's not the right avenue for you. So there's a bit of a mindset shift to it. It is a mindset shift. And and I've researched a lot the difference, you know, traditional publishing and, and self-publishing for myself, but also for clients. And I think it used to be that self-publishing was kind of, well, if you can't get a book deal, then perhaps you could self-publish. But I'm seeing more and more now that there are really are pros and cons for both. And for some people, Maybe traditional publishing would be absolutely right for them. But for other people, I think self-publishing should be their first and chosen option because there are pros of that route too. Yeah, it's definitely not the poor relation anymore, is it? No. And some people have a very clear purpose that they want their book to fulfill and that will involve supporting a program that they're running or a speaking engagement that they're doing or they know where the book fits in their ecosystem of their business. And so that control is really important. And they want to be able to publish it themselves and get it out in their time frame and so on. In fact, I would say the majority of my clients would fall into that category that the book, has, they know where it's going to fit and what they want it to do. Yeah, and, and I think the book, as you said earlier, is the means to open the doors to other things in your business. So we need to look at it as how does it expand the people that I'm reaching? How does it get my ideas out there? How is it opening doors? How am I able to use the publicity around this book to actually achieve other goals? So we look at it in the wide in terms of what role it fills for you. And when you can see it that way, then it's not about whether it's a commercial book idea that's going to sell so many copies it's about actually how it fits with the way you want to show up the legacy that you're building the body of work that you're building and how it's going to serve that reader at the end of the day and so we become less focused on those commercial metrics that are, are sort of the things we've been told over the years right we that's what we hear about sunday times bestseller list you know that isn't necessarily what you need the book to do oh i love that and that that for me makes it very clear just as you're saying that, I was kind of applying what you were saying to myself. And I was like, yeah, that, that, oh my goodness, it's very clear now what I want my book to do and why I'm writing it. So that's so helpful. I think I can really see now how there's such a need for what you do, Christine. <laughs> it, <laughs> just ha- Honestly, I just having someone who understands the process, because one thing about you that I've noticed is that you get super interested and engaged in other people's topics and ideas. You said yourself earlier, that's the part of your job that you love. And I think that really comes across. So I can't wait to work with you more moving forward. Oh. Me too. And it's funny, I think I said to you when we first met that I feel like people will appear in my inbox and we'll have a conversation and it's almost like the topics show up and I'm like, damn it, now I need to look at that. You know, so someone showed up that was, I've got a fitness coach at the moment that was uh, about, you know, getting back out there and uh, ramping up your exercise program. And when she said, I was like, damn it. I know that's what I need to look at, you know, but it's like I learned so much. So you exactly, you were talking about rewilding your business. I'm like, yeah, that would be great. You know, so people, yeah, the things that arrive on my desk are almost always in perfect timing. <laughs> I love that. Perfect. I love that. Mm. <laughs> I think that's amazing. And I love that you notice that as well. I think it happens all the time. I think a lot of people don't notice, but yeah, I love being open to Oh, that. no, it's there. Oh, no, I was just going to say I'm working now with a life coach who was my client and has written a book. And then she'll say something. I'm like, yeah, I've read that. All right. I don't need to hear it again. (laughs) But reading the book, reading the book, even though I worked on her book and read it with her. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to work with you. And that's also a pretty common experience that one of my clients, a business coach, and four years after her book came out, she'll still say, oh, someone's just come to me because they read my book. And now the time is right, which is fantastic. I think that's a really important point to make as well, actually, because I think, you know, there's a couple of reasons 
for me that writing the book now is very important. One of them is that I really want to step further into thought leadership around the things I talk about. So it's a really important bit. But also I am noticing a lot now that there is a getting a bigger and bigger lag between people first coming into our world and knowing about us and people working to making that decision to invest and work with us. I think that's perfectly normal and perfectly okay. And having a book out there is another brilliant way for people to get to know you and your style over a longer period. They might read the book, like you say, and then they're coming when the time is right and ready for them. And one of the things in Rewild Your Business, certainly in the retreat, is let's focus less on urgency and trying to convince someone to work with us and persuade someone to work with us. It just Let's let go of all of that and allow people to make the right decision for them at the right time for them. And a book is a lovely, gentle way of helping people do that. It's like, take this, look at it in your own time. If this resonates with you, it could be that we would work beautifully together. And if it doesn't, maybe we wouldn't. And that's okay too. And letting go of that urgency, that need, that kind of desperation to enroll as quickly as possible, I think is is so important. Oh, I love that. And for coaches out there, it will never replace what you do entirely. You, sometimes people really worry about giving away the farm in the book. And there's a balance there in terms of what you share and you don't share that's individual to each author. But I think coaches, people work with a coach for so many reasons that go beyond just the knowledge. And so you can read it all, but sometimes you just really need that person to take you through it, even if you've read it. But as you say, it warms the client to your philosophy. And if it resonates with them, then they're going to keep following you. And then if the time is right, then they're ready, So, which is a beautiful thing. Exactly. Christine, I've loved talking to you today. Thank you so much, because I really know this is going to be so helpful for so many people listening who have this ambition within their business to write a book. I I just know they do. And so I think this would be super helpful. Where can people reach you if they'd like to find out more about what you do and the kind of clients you work with and and who you help and how you help them? Yeah, thank you. My website is bookcoach.co.nz. My Instagram candle is at Christine Sheehy underscore book coach. And my Substack publication is called Right to the Heart of Your Work, or you can find me under my name, which is Christine Sheehy, S-H-E-E-H-Y. Thank you so much for having me, Jill. Oh, my goodness. My pleasure. I will put links in the show notes to all of the things we've talked about today and particularly to where you can find Christine. And if you are someone like me who has an ambition, who has just this burning desire to be an author, leave a legacy, have an impact, all of those things, then I would highly recommend you reach out to Christine because I'm very excited about working with her. And I I already can't wait to recommend you to some of the other wonderful women in my life. So thank you so much. And let's talk again very soon. Thank you. The book is a happening thing, everyone. So yeah. Rewild your business yeah, coming soon. Accountability straight away. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks, Jill. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that getting our heads together this week has filled your mind with what's possible. If you love the show, would you do me a massive favour, please? Would you leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts? It would really help you put more heads together reach more ears and expand more minds. Until next week, bye for now.